2006, in the prime of life, Mike Coe retired from his career as a TV news cameraman in the UK and decided to build one of the most energy efficient homes in all of Great Britain. But four short years later after moving in, he and his partner Lizzie sold their once in a lifetime project in the south of England and moved to the Scottish Highlands. Sounds kind of strange. Why would they go do that? Having become increasingly concerned about climate change, Mike decided to return to camera work after completing the house and took to interviewing leading scientists and experts on the subject. What he learned shocked him. He realized that the earth is warming so rapidly that southern England might become oppressively hot within just a few years. A move north to Scotland's colder climate could buy him and Lizzie some time, he thought. As part of a video explaining his new energy-efficient building project on the Isle of Skye, Mike put together one of the most interesting, understandable, and eye-opening short videos on climate change I've seen. This version was produced exclusively for Climate Matters TV. To watch the full report and learn more about Mike's Poor Tree Passive House building project, visit poortreepassivehouse.uk. Let's pick up where Mike abandons hope that his groundbreaking eco-house will have any influence at all on the cheap way houses are built in the UK, with little or no regard for conservation or the environment. Deciding that he would concentrate his energies elsewhere to make a difference, he turned to the one obvious thing he could do. Although I was disillusioned, I still wanted to do something to try to make a difference. I was still very much focused on climate change and on the fact that any meaningful action would have to be at all levels, from grassroots right up to global politics. Publicity, increasing awareness of our plight, seemed to be the thing I should concentrate on. I did my first U-turn and decided to pick up a video camera once again. I bought a professional camera kit, amazingly affordable now compared to when I first joined the industry, and I contacted climate activists offering my services. As a result, I was back on the road again, shooting and editing. A new adventure which took me, with Lizzie assisting, all over the UK and to the COP21 climate conference in Paris. It might be one degree year, but it's much warmer year. That's why the ice is melting. I found that when I was working on something I was fully committed to, with relatively little time pressure, I rather enjoyed it. Now every organism, every species has some kind of effect on its surroundings. It's when one of them gets out of hand that you've got problems. In the beginning, well, around 20,000 BC, it was pretty chilly. But moving forward from there, we can see a steady increase in global temperature, the dotted line on the left. At around 11,000 BC, the trend reversed and the temperature began to drop. There are a number of possible reasons. Some are on this chart. One not mentioned is that around this time, man invented agriculture, planting crops which altered the reflectivity, or albedo, of the Earth's surface, sending more solar energy back out into space. Moving on again, this brief period of cooling ended, and the Earth entered a period where the temperature was relatively stable for millennia. We then entered the so-called Little Ice Age, caused by a reduction in solar activity. But then, all of a sudden, around 200 years ago, things changed dramatically, and the temperature began to rise at a rate not seen in the previous 22,000 years. In a period representing just 0.9% of, of this entire timeline, there was an unprecedented increase in global temperatures. These words here are extremely significant. Turn this graphic round and you'll see the shape of Michael Mann's famous hockey stick curve. Now let's look at this graphic, remarkably similar to the previous one, but this time showing atmospheric carbon dioxide on the vertical axis with the same horizontal axis. The upward tilt in the curve, running in parallel with the Industrial Revolution, is almost identical. The increase in CO2 has caused the increase in temperature. Change the horizontal scale to cover the 20,000 year time period we began with and it's clear that what's happening now is far from typical. You have to be pretty blinkered or in denial to ignore the effects of this warming. In recent years, here in the UK, we've had serious flooding in the West Midlands, Somerset and Yorkshire. 
Globally, extreme weather events such as Hurricane Haiyan in the Philippines and floods in India, Bangladesh and Nepal have left thousands dead and caused untold suffering. The United States has seen hurricanes Katrina and Sandy, and just recently Harvey, which has broken multiple records with disastrous consequences, both human and financial. The severity of all of these storms has been amplified by the effects of climate change. Katrina and Sandy were said to be one in a hundred year events. A storm as serious as Harvey, one in 800 years. All three have taken place within the space of 12 years. Unless we address the root causes, there will be more and worse to come. Storms such as these are obvious signs that something is going wrong. But it's the less obvious, more insidious things taking place beyond our immediate horizons, which are an even greater worry. We hear about the melting of the Arctic sea ice, but what does it mean? Well, one thing it means is that sea levels are rising. The crucial question is by how much? The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, is the body many governments look to for guidance on climate issues. Yet because of the way it operates, the IPCC's predictions are always out of date and extremely conservative. In its last full report in 2013, it predicted a very modest rise in sea levels, 82 centimetres by the year 2100. L'accord de Paris pour le climat est accepté. In 2015, the Paris Accord reached a broad agreement on ideally limiting global temperature rise to one and a half degrees. And since then, more realistic estimates have begun to emerge on sea level rise. The Paris Accord are great, right? They came back with 1.5 degrees instead of 2 degrees. That's the right move. Um, except, as uh, scientists, we all know we're going to go beyond the 1.5 degree. Uh, we're probably already there. Um, and we, it's going to be difficult to limit ourselves below 2 degrees. And we know from the paleo record that's not going to protect us from sea level. We are committing ourselves to a 6 to 9 meter sea level rise if we stay in that climate. That would mean loss of all coastal cities, most of the world's large cities, and all their history. However, sea level rise is only one of multiple interlinked effects of climate change already affecting us today. We've seen 16 of the hottest years on record since the year 2000, with 2016 being the hottest recorded so far. 2017 may well break that record. We're already seeing disintegrating ecosystems, record-breaking wildfires and heat waves which put human life at risk. Violent storms and flooding are putting infrastructure at risk. Droughts and soil erosion are putting food supplies at risk. Long dormant bacteria and viruses trapped in ice and permafrost for centuries are reviving as the climate warms. Carbon dioxide, the main gas responsible for climate change, is soluble in water, leading to acidification of the oceans, which is having a devastating effect on marine life, an essential part of the delicately balanced global ecosystem. The Great Barrier Reef is said to now be at a terminal stage. The solubility of CO2 in water had a direct effect on us at the autonomous house, where I had to add a pH corrector to the rainwater harvesting system. It now rains dilute carbonic acid, which started to dissolve the copper pipes and threaten the plumbing. This is the sort of thing you might not find out about if you only use mains water. Climate change, combined with mankind's other activities, has triggered the sixth mass extinction, with species being lost at over 1,000 times the normal background rate. Scientists have described this as a biological annihilation. This could place our own future in peril, as over time, plant and animal species which we rely on may well be wiped out. One really striking thing I noticed when I was reading up on the current mess we're in is how quickly everything is unravelling. Progressions which were originally linear are accelerating rapidly and becoming exponential, and one of the main reasons for this is positive feedbacks. These are a game changer. They feed on themselves and they feed on each other, accelerating the effects of warming until they reach tipping points. 
points beyond which, in practical terms, there's no going back. Just one example is solar energy. When the sun shines on a vast expanse of bright white ice, over 90% of the energy is reflected back out into space. As soon as the ice begins to break up, it exposes the dark ocean surface which absorbs significant amounts of energy, increasing the rate of warming, leading to further ice loss. Disruption of the weather caused by global warming increases the amount of water vapour in the atmosphere, which itself acts as a greenhouse gas, causing further warming. The higher temperatures and semi-drought conditions in some areas turn forests into tinder boxes. As we've seen in the news only recently, fires break out, destroying trees which previously converted carbon dioxide into oxygen. The soot released into the atmosphere can float as far as the poles, where it drops out onto the ice, darkening the surface and increasing the rate of heat absorption so the ice melts faster. Changing conditions which encourage growth of algae on the ice worsen the so-called dark snow problem. These are just a few of a multitude of positive feedbacks which scientists have identified so far. Any of them could be at or beyond the point of no return. Just a couple of ice cubes can chill an entire glass of water. And the reason is that it takes a lot of energy to convert a solid into a liquid. In the case of water, it's a factor of 80, compared to increasing the temperature of already liquid water by one degree. This effect is known as the latent heat of fusion. It means that most of the energy being absorbed in the formerly ice-covered Arctic and Antarctic is currently going into melting the remaining ice, which is temporarily holding the temperature down. Once all of the ice has gone, then sea temperatures will just race away, and all the other effects of global warming will follow rapidly. But there's another gas playing a significant role in climate change. Methane, frozen in permafrost for centuries, is beginning to escape in alarming quantities. Although it decays quickly, its warming potential is 80 times that of CO2. It's exacerbating the greenhouse effect already, but researchers are particularly worried Whoa. about a possible multi-gigaton <laughs> methane release from the melting the subsea bad. permafrost off the coast of Siberia, which would cause global temperatures to soar within as little as a decade. We're seeing that the permafrost melting and we're seeing the methane already being released. So it's not a high, a low probability, high catastrophe uh, risk. It's a high catastrophe, high probability risk. We should be making one of our highest scientific priorities, studying and trying to do something about the possibility of a methane outbreak from the Arctic. And unfortunately we're not, because that's, that's scarcely mentioned in in by IPCC in its assessment because I think it's being criminally kind of complacent in not wanting to stress or even talk about the, the possibility of some major catastrophes. So where are we now and where are we heading in the current great warming event? At the moment the general consensus among scientists is that we could still technically pull ourselves back from the brink of catastrophic climate change. But in order to stand any chance of success, we'd have to actively manipulate the climate, a technique known as geoengineering. The idea of geoengineering has been around for a very long time. One possible strategy would be to reduce the amount of solar energy reaching the Earth by reflecting some of it back into space, a technique known as solar radiation management. There are various ideas, including giant mirrors floating in space, brightening clouds to make them more reflective, and dropping particles in the upper atmosphere, possibly by adding chemicals such as sulphur to aircraft fuel. In other words, addressing the problems caused by pollution with more pollution. But the only really effective option, alongside unprecedented cuts in our emissions, appears to be direct removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, storing it somewhere else, perhaps deep underground. At least this would address the root of the problem, the difficulty is, this technology is still very much in its infancy, with just this one experimental plant now operational in Switzerland. We are a very, very long way away from being able to remove enough CO2 to undo the results of 200 years worth of dumping waste into the atmosphere. We may well never get there, at least not in time. I don't know when that 
time point is. Uh, I don't think the IPCC uses representative concentration pathways, or RCPs, to try to predict what concentrations of greenhouse gases will take us to what future temperatures. It's worth going through this a little bit because there's a question of why are we doing this, why are we doing this research, this is why, this is the uh, latest projections. And the alarming thing is that these two scenarios explicitly include negative emissions technologies. So there is geoengineering of the flavour of carbon dioxide removal in the best case scenarios. The very, very alarming thing for us is that we are on this path here. That's AR 8.5. We are slap bang on this trajectory. And that puts us in a very, very different place in our children's or our grandchildren's lifetimes. Virtually every single emission scenario that we've so far generated includes geoengineering. It, it assumes it automatically works. Now that's fine if one or two of the scenarios had that, but almost every single scenario has it. So already what we're, what we're finding is that geoengineering, even though it, we, it's still in a very experimental conceptual stage, that we are assuming it will work and we are embedding it in our scenarios and from those are what, what we go on to advise policymakers from. The emissions pathway in this projection, which we're following, the only one which doesn't include geoengineering, is extremely dangerous. RCPs from 4.5 to 8.5 will lead to total loss of the polar ice sheets and of so many trees that atmospheric greenhouse gases will increase to the point that mankind simply won't be able to survive, one reason being we won't be able to grow the food we need. We've already reached one degree of warming above pre-industrial levels and CO2 concentrations are still rising. Inertia in the system of two to three decades means we've yet to experience the effects of recent emissions, which have been higher than at any time in the past. The chances of staying on one of the safer pathways are extremely slim. I think we all hope that emission reductions will be achieved, but the uh, lack of success of current attempt at international agreements encourages pessimism. And I honestly would bet sad though it is, that the annual CO2 emissions are going to rise year by year for at least the next 20 years. Even if we manage to develop a carbon capture and storage system capable of removing billions of tonnes of CO2 from the atmosphere, we'd still need to reduce our own emissions dramatically. We could only do this with unprecedented changes to our lifestyles. We're already way beyond the point where we could install low energy lighting, drive electric cars, insulate our houses and then carry on as we've always done. Anybody who suggests otherwise is probably an oil company executive, a politician or a traditional economist. The issue of economic growth and whether we can actually have the, the ongoing the, um, improvement in our economy as we currently measure it at the same time of, of responding to the, the challenge of climate change is a really thorny issue and actually a lot of people will, will shy away from it. What I have done and what colleagues and I, and I have done is tried to say if we look just simply at the maths of the climate science and then we look at what the economists tell us you can achieve with a growing economy, we can show very clearly you cannot put those two together. Now that is a, an unpopular message but as scientists our concern is not about being liked, it's whether people disagree with our message. And actually, people that no one has come forward that I'm aware of um, who said that actually the analysis that we're doing is wrong. So we cannot continue with economic growth and avoid catastrophic warming. The sort of changes we need would include dramatic reductions in air travel, including a programme of airport closures. We're currently still arguing about a third runway at Heathrow. There would need to be a lot less personal travel, significantly reduced consumption, longer lasting consumer products, eliminating the fad purchasing of, for example, mobile phones and fashion items. We would need more local sourcing of goods and food, with a huge shift away from meat eating to reduce the significant warming effects of methane produced globally by windy livestock. In the longer term, we must reduce the size of the human population, because if we don't do it, the effects of climate change will. These changes are so sweeping that no politician, even if they understood the issues, would dare put them forward. They would undoubtedly be voted out at the earliest opportunity and ostracised by their chums in big business. This is why, aside from ramping up the rhetoric in recent years, politicians have effectively done nothing for decades. 
something James Hansen spoke about in Paris in one of Stuart Scott's climatematters.tv presentations. All the ministers are coming here, or the heads of state, and they're planning to clap each other on the back and say, oh, we're really doing great. We're, this is a very successful conference. We're going to address the climate problem. Well, if that's what happens, then we're screwing the next generation and the following ones. So our politics, hand in hand with traditional economics and an almost religious devotion to perpetual growth, make it virtually impossible for us to avoid catastrophic climate change. This is why I feel that when scientists say it's technically possible, it'll never actually happen because fundamentally we aren't capable of the necessary level of global cooperation. If we were, we might have avoided being in this mess in the first place. The most realistic prediction of our likely future which I've heard comes from atmospheric scientist Dr. Ira Leifer, who says, Some scientists are indicating we should make plans to adapt to a four degree hotter world. While prudent, one wonders what portion of the population could adapt to such a world. My view is that it's just a few thousand people seeking refuge in the Arctic or Antarctica. It took a while for the implications of my newfound knowledge to sink in. I realized that as with the autonomous house, nothing I do as an individual will make any difference. My interactions with some of the world's most eminent climate scientists reinforced my view. The only hope, I think, would be for a global protest movement so powerful and so united that world leaders would be forced to take notice and act. By the time the situation is bad enough for this to happen, so many positive feedbacks will be running, the world will be an unstoppable thermal runaway. All of the temperature graphs are already almost vertical. We have a very real and very serious crisis on our hands. This isn't an easy message to deliver, but I tend to feel that anybody looking at the work of scientists in as much detail as I have, and crucially, with an open mind, would surely come to the same conclusions. And yet governments are still ignoring or underestimating the risks. There's a smokescreen of normality when things are anything but normal. And what we're talking about is the future of the planet and the delicately balanced ecosystems which have allowed us to thrive here. It's the future for all of us. It's the future for the children it's the future for life on Earth. It's ironic that people are watching the amazing wildlife documentaries made by David Attenborough and loving and adoring the planet when we're about to destroy it. It's a huge responsibility we have. We humans are just one species on this planet, but we've done so much damage. <laughs>